I want to be out here as long as I can. The top predator are polar bears. Polar bears spend their time stalking prey, which is not what most bears do. Oh. How many days can this go on? I heard a big animal. Sometimes you eat the bear, sometimes the bear eats you. Alone, new season, Thursday, May 26th at 9, only on the History Channel. Here he is, the guy from Alone. <laughs> hey. Now, it, now, is it Dr. Tan or Timogen? Timogen, Dr. Tan, whatever suits your fancy. <laughs> okay. And you're a doctor. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, a very interesting and uh, weird thing to do. What crazy doctor would um, take a a long vacation to try to survive in the middle of nowhere. And that's me. <laughs> well, that's, that's true. We'll get to that too. So, I mean, I'm a huge fan of Alone. And this is a uh, year on season nine that it's just about to uh, appear on what, May 27th. This is, everybody's all excited about it. It's on History Channel. And you're on it. Uh, maybe for a day, maybe you won. We don't know. <laughs> You'll see. Uh, but, <laughs> we will see. If nobody's ever seen the show, which I, I quite, you know, think that's impossible but what is the show this show is the olympics of the survival world you get 10 people you let them choose 10 things and you see them battle out the elements the predators the starvation the hunting and see how long they could last hopefully for that five five hundred thousand dollar prize alone day one labrador you're not gonna make it easy for us are you came here to do a job why does it have to be such a struggle my whole life i've been running from a troubled childhood i don't like killing things if i don't have to i heard a big animal my heart beats pretty irregular i don't know what i'm chasing out here oh so hungry there's nothing nothing mother i'm sorry for all the things that put you through how many days can this go on is that really what triggered you i mean the, the money or was it something else absolutely not the money was not even uh, a thought it would be nice but um as an american medical graduate that was basically the my, my debt <laughs> so is that a sexy thing no not really um so it really had to be something else uh, to keep me there and to keep me motivated and uh, it was an interesting journey because as you go through something like this, and I'm sure people who've done hard things in their life will tell you the same. Uh, the reason why you keep on going in that grind needs to be good enough and you need to adapt it every single day because if it's not, uh, you're going to slip in a really, really nasty downward spiral. Did you go to the show or did they come to you to, uh, to apply? So they initially reached out to me. Um, so one of the contestants from a previous season, um, he followed me for my medical content. So what I teach online is surviving medical illnesses in austere environments. And uh, it was interesting because a lot of the myths out there are still being propagated by survival experts. And it just may be because um, guides are not readily updated, especially the paper copies, where medicine on a very regular basis is updated almost at a yearly, if not sooner basis. Let me show you how to stitch up a wound without these instruments. We're talking about gaping cuts like this that are not bleeding. In our last video, we learned how to suture with instruments. So if you haven't seen that yet, check it out next. This time we'll stitch up the wound with things that we would have on a hiking trip, like a sewing kit and duct tape. So if you have a gaping cut like this and it's not bleeding, but you want to close it just so that the scar is reduced, then you can do this. You want to make sure you rinse this cut out with water. You can sanitize the edges and move out debris. And then you can start using duct tape. So a lot of the things that they were doing for snake bites, for bleeds, for infections were just very, very wrong. So as I've been uh, teaching more online, he reached out to me and I think he told someone in the casting uh, department about me and they reached out. That's great because I, I checked your YouTube channel out and it's amazing. It's very unique. What's up everyone? My name is Dr. Tan. Today we are talking about fractures, sprains, and massive bleeds if we have enough time. Um, but we'll roll, roll the intro and we'll get started. Very unique. Uh, thank you, I, thank I, you. Yeah, it's fantastic. And what what is it called again? Is it on your, it's on your name, but it's. Mm -hmm. 
So you can find all my stuff if you search survival doctors. So uh, we're a team of uh, medical professionals. We range from physicians, physician assistants, nurses, EMT, paramedics, and so forth. Um, and uh, we help people learn how to overcome injury and illness in survival situations. Today, we are talking about hooks in your hand. Fish hook injuries are super common. So let's talk about a few important points about hooks in your hands and fingers. Now, get this. So did your colleagues sort of say, what are you, what, what are you thinking? What are you doing? Like, like, especially right now, because I'm pretty sure that the, the hospitals were really busy while, while you're out there in the woods, right? Uh, did Absolutely. they question you? A hundred percent. They questioned why I was going. So, um, I was in a very interesting situation. So I trained in the U S um, and it takes about six months for your American license, your medical license to transfer to Canada. So I had a little bit of time to take off because uh, I could work in the States and then wait for that license to pull through in Canada. But I decided to do this once in a lifetime experience. And That's they thought crazy. I was crazy for it. <laughs> they thought I was crazy for it. It's a pay cut, basically. Isn't it true that to do something like a loan, you'd have to be a little <laughs> crazy? I, would, I, I like the term unique. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. Yeah. Yes, I think if you are on a loan with the intention to win, you are at a phase in your mindset that you're willing to risk life and limb to the point where you get pulled out by someone saying that you cannot go, even though in your mind, in your heart, you're pushing, you got to be a little, little special. Now, was it the time too where um, the crew, uh, they didn't really care about checking up on you that much because you're Dr. Tan for heaven's sake, you'll, you're, you'll, be, you'll be fine. <laughs> Well, it, it is a, a little bit of an awkward situation, you know, um, I, at the time, uh, for the most part of the show, had the highest level of medical training there. So um, let's say if someone were to tell me I had to leave for a particular reason, and um, I did not think it, that was the case, if I had grounds for it, then it would be a very hard situation to pull me when I know more than you. Oh, I hope that scene happens. That would be phenomenal. <laughs> wouldn't that, wouldn't that be that funny? Scene. Oh, that would be great. I'm not going. I know more than you do. <laughs> exactly. It makes me think of like Parks and Rec. <laughs> hey, look, my leg's not broken. I'm telling you right now, it's not broken. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, you, you've also had experience in the military. So today we are talking about the explosion in Beirut on August 4th, 2020, because many were killed and thousands were injured. Hospitals are currently overwhelmed, leaving people on the streets to care for themselves. So today we're talking about massive uncontrolled bleeding from extremities, your hands and feet, because those injuries kill you fast. Yeah, so I did uh, six years in the Canadian Armed Forces. And uh, one of the things that I was very grateful for is uh, cold weather warfare training and survival training up with uh, the Cree Nation in the subarctic of uh, Quebec. So that was definitely, definitely something that made me feel comfortable in the cold and uh, comfortable making solid, solid shelters. Because basically, when you train in Arctic warfare, you train to make bomb-proof shelters because you are literally taking heavy fire from mortars, from tank rounds, from machine guns, and that thing needs to be solid. You got shot. What do you do next? Stick around if you want to learn how to pack this wound. Wow, that's incredible. And also, uh, uh, you were with, with the a first responder as well. Yeah, yep. So I was a, a first responder uh, for kind of my youth, like high school, before I got into uh, medicine, medicine. Um, and uh, one of the things that I did once I became a physician was I did additional training in wilderness medicine. So that's a subset of emergency medicine and uh, specifically looking at uh, resource limited situations, whether that's let's say in uh, Beirut with that explosion and ambulance can't get to you. Or if it's in the middle of nowhere, like in Labrador, what do you do to um, splint or reduce a fracture? What do you do to stop a bleed there? Um, what do you do to uh, make sure that you're well and uh, not freaking out mentally as well? Cause that's, you'll see is a, a really big component of uh, the show. So uh, people that are listening um, and watching, uh, what would you think is the, 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 the five top accidents that can happen in a wilderness setting? Mm -hmm. Number one, um, I would say it's, it's common um, injuries related to tripping on things. So the landscape in a lot of these places are incredibly, incredibly wild. You know, there's no paths there, maybe some deer tracks, um, but there's a lot of bound trees, a lot of slippery rocks, people falling, hitting their heads, 
twisting their ankles. Um, and it just takes a wrong angle with the right amount of force to break something. Um, so I would say that's one of the, um, the higher high risk things. And number two, this may not be a direct cause of things, but dehydration at the very beginning is a big, a real, a real, real threat because what happens is you get a little delirious. What happens when you can't make a fire because it's too darn wet in Labrador um, and you can't boil your water? You risk drinking some tainted water, you get a bunch of diarrhea, you vomit a bunch, you get even more dehydrated, you make stupid decisions. And then when that happens, you might be handling your, your ax wrong or something like that and really hurt yourself. Wow, wow. <laughs> Was there a moment where you thought, if someone else get, gets injured, uh, one of the other con contestants, they might just call on you to go <laughs> help out. <laughs> you know what? Like, that was a thought. I remember getting a message um, about some kind of emergency response. And I, like, it, it may have been like starvation kind of talking to me, but I thought, like, does this mean they want me to go to this? Like, I, I'm not sure what this, this, uh, uh, this warning means, you know? <laughs> so I was like, ready to like go. Like, I got my, first aid kit ready for whatever we got there. And uh, I was ready to go and consult because um, yeah, all hands on deck in real situations like that. And I'm even more happy to do it um, when I feel like I'm closer to that victim. That's great. Now uh, your 10 items, was one of them a first aid kit? So 10 items, um, first aid kit is not included in uh, the 10 items uh, that you can select. Um, so is there um, some things that uh, you can use within the kit that you are given for safety stuff? Sure, there's very minor stuff that you can use, um, but strictly a lot of the stuff that were, was given as options for your 10 items are for bare bones survival. Um, the one thing that I brought that may be somewhat medical, and I'll talk about it uh, as the series airs, is an emergency ration. It's gonna be a mystery ration until I, kind of go a deep dive into why I brought that. Well, wow. okay, you got me watching now. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, Labrador, so it was on the big big river. And big river. Um, yeah, so uh, explain that landscape. So the landscape, the big river uh, drains from the ocean and it goes through a bunch of different valleys, incredible different landscapes, you got bogs, um, mountainous uh, terrain, big plateaus, and just incredible amounts of thick brush um, just to get to uh, point A from B or B to A. Uh, and when you're doing scouts or just running your trap line, it was a lot of effort. And again, things are so thick that it's pretty easy to get turned around. Wow. What was the biggest challenge for you? Uh, uh, look at the environment, not the show itself, but the environment, the Labrador itself, what was the biggest challenge? Mm -hmm. I think when you're out there in a survival situation, any logical person would look for patterns, right? Patterns that can assist you in looking at um, animal behavior, patterns in uh, how the water changes, how the fish change, and all these different patterns. What was really crazy about the weather in Labrador is the patterns were all messed up. You couldn't predict anything. It could be sunny one day and torrential the other day. Um, and it could change in the middle of the day if it so chooses and just gives you snow. <laughs> so it was very, very confusing. And it did make building shelters and hunting uh, that much more challenging. When, uh, whether it was the helicopter or boat, I'm not sure whatever dropped you off. Uh, mm -hmm. The first five minutes, were you anxious? Were you excited? Were you, were you like fearful of your, your life? Mm -hmm. Were you like uh, pumped? Uh, what was the feeling like? All the emotions. You know, you are so excited to begin this adventure. Um, you are terrified because you have, for my situation, only uh, an hour or so of sunlight uh, after drop. <laughs> And um, yeah, you just uh, have to deal with a lot of predators at the same time as you're trying to build something to protect yourself. So that in between where a bear could just grab you by the feet while you're sleeping is an unsettling, unsettling situation. Did you uh, become less fearful of your surroundings the longer you were out there? Did you reconnect to nature is what I'm getting at? Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. So the connection to the land it felt like such an ancient land you could almost feel it in the ground feel it in the trees 
of how old it was. And it was almost like you could feel a presence, a spiritual presence in the land. Uh, I found myself talking out loud, both for, to the camera, but also to myself and to whatever was out there. And I felt every time I asked for help, it was right around the corner. And that was a, an incredible, powerful feeling. Wow, that's fantastic. I really want to watch the show. I hope you won. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, uh, you're one of two Canadians on the show. And um, uh, there's been Canadians on the show before. Because I, I know it's a silly question, but it's not. A lot of Canadians would want me to ask this. Because you were in Canada, you were in Labrador, and you were Canadian, did the other people think just, well, he, he should win? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone in every single season have a right to be there. They are incredible individuals, talented in their own right, and specialists in their own right as well. I think uh, people coming from Southern climates may have some weather adjustment, but then again, a lot of these people coming from warmer climates are excellent hunters. So there is an equilibrium. And even though we have our benefits and our, our, our edge, I think uh, in the end, things even out. What was the one thing uh, that you learned out there that you did not have any skill set at all when you went in? Do you know what the scariest thing is? Trying to do this experience when you've never hunted before. You know how terrifying that is to know oh. that, yeah, I've never hunted before. This wow. is the first time I've hunted and um, I'm excited to share that journey with you. But my thought was like, I'll bring my bow. I'm a good shot with a bow, but I've never used it to hunt before. I just target shot for seven, eight years. Um, so to change that was, um, hey, this is, this can be like the make or break point. And um, if fish is all I've caught in the past, can I do some mammals? Can I get birds and stuff like that? So that's, uh, that was a big, big thing that was weighing on me. But then again, it's, it's either you do it or you don't. And um, you can't be down on yourself when you miss a shot because, uh, you know, all you need to do is uh, be focused and clear. Can't hesitate. To go from one to the other, I mean, the idea the first time you would ever even kill a creature to consume it. I don't know if you did or not. Hopefully you did to eat something. Uh, what, what kind of emotions was that? Taking a life, as anyone could imagine, is, um, is a big mixed emotion, especially if you're really hungry for it. And the one thing that a lot of people who've been through this have experienced is the gratitude, the gratitude for any substance um, and uh, gratitude and respect for life. You know, it's, it's not the, the same thing as going out and shooting something with a rifle and uh, putting it in the fridge, you know. You feel so, so grateful for that uh, little critter to give you some nutrients. Um, and I think that was more valuable than um, the actual nutritional value of, um, of things in general, because it gives you a new appreciation on the human experience. And I think that's worth millions. Yeah, incredible, incredible answer. So who got you started in nature? Who, who got you going into the, the idea of you know, wilderness travel? I think when I look back at my childhood and look at all the mischief I've been through, it's got to be my godfather. It's a French Canadian guy, big outdoorsman, hikes all over the place. And his dad was the type of person to go up in a tree with a buck knife covered in mud and jumping on a buck and just slitting its throat. And that's, I think, just trickled down to the generations to me. And uh, yeah, we, in our own ways, uh, push the boundaries of what exploration and excitement is. Um, and I got a lot of that spirit from uh, my godfather. That's great. It's great. And uh, are your friends there and you family going to uh, bet? Is there any money <laughs> wagers going on? Or? <laughs> oh, my, my family is rooting for me because, again, this is um, as someone coming from a, a different background than the typical person. None of my family has ever watched this show before and just got into it because I've been in it. Um, so it is incredibly um wild to them to, to even think a person that you could see in the office could be out there doing what we did out there um, so they're rooting for me if they're placing bets they're probably doing it under the table um, but uh, yeah it's going to be an incredible season I really think this season is going to be a good watch 
I'm really excited. That's fantastic. I really enjoyed the talk. And by the way, this is a whiskey fireside chat. I'm not sure if they told you this. This is why I'm drinking whiskey during the talk. And uh, ah. I'm having writer's tears because I'm a writer and I cry a lot. Tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks a lot. Uh, That's amazing. Dr. Tan, uh, Timogen. Um, and really looking forward to uh, seeing the show and hope you won. I hope so too. You'll see. <laughs>